Blessed congregation, as we gather together to worship on this Christmas day, let's join the multitude of the heavenly hosts, shall we? And praise God and say glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill towards men, for Christ is born, the Savior, to give eternal life to his own. And we rejoice that he has come to us and visits us in the preaching of the gospel this morning. Let us celebrate. Receive now the blessing of God. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's come, all ye faithful, and enter into the worship of God in song as we turn to the Psalter hymnal number 341 and sing the well-known Christmas carol, O Come, All Ye Faithful. We are reminded in this day of fads and perhaps especially in this season of the year where so many are celebrating more mistletoe than Messiah of the wonderful truth that we have that's been passed down to all generations and that truth that's recorded in the sacred scriptures of that wonderful gospel story of the birth of the Savior his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his coming again. No fad, but the wonderful story of the gospel. And we are reminded as well that we have passed on to us a truth, a truth of these things in the creeds of the Christian church. And we're, we're glad that God has given the church of all ages this great deposit of truth that guides the church into the truth and keeps her from error and gives us a, a great sense of peace that God has been with his people always, and he shall be with us in the coming year and always until he comes again. What we want to do uh, this morning, as is our custom on special services, is to reflect upon one of the creeds of the church, and 
Here I'm going to read for you the Nicene Creed, and it's found in the back of uh, page 4 of this Psalter hymnal. I'm not sure if it's in yours. It's one of those ecumenical creeds that sets forth the truth of the triune God and also of the incarnation of the Savior. And you'll note here it's a creed. That's from the Greek word credo, which means a statement of faith. And we say this in our hearts too, with the creed and with the church of all ages, these things. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. See, that's what faith does, children. Helps us to see invisible things, even the God who's spirit and the wonderful blessings of salvation, which are spiritual and heavenly. We're so thankful for the gift of faith. But then we go on to say, and I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds. You see, before he was born in Bethlehem, he was begotten of the Father, the eternal Son, proceeding and begotten from the Father before all worlds. God of God, that's who Jesus is, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's now sing in celebration of the birth of Christ. 339.
Let's join in prayer to God together. Our gracious heavenly God and Father, how we thank Thee with all our hearts that You have given Thy Son. He is born this day in the city of David. He is Christ the Lord. And angels have told us to hark, to hear what God is saying. And the Word of God is calling us and speaking to us this morning to hear this message of the incarnate Son of God. And we rejoice. We come, we and our children and family and friends, gather together to worship. How fitting to give God the praise, to turn to the giver of every good and perfect gift, from whom is our life eternal, since he's given the Son, that precious gift of the Savior. Lord, may this be our focus as we worship thee this day, and as we seek to be an outstanding people by the grace of God, who are witnesses, witnesses, testifiers of the truth as it is in Jesus, and of the great gift which we would call on all, on men, all men to receive, that they might know eternal life. Lord, we're gathered in an assembly of, of people who, who know the value, the, the great value of this precious Son, and the great cost of heaven itself, for the Son empties himself of glory and becomes a little babe and bears our sin on his shoulders. What great cost, what great sacrifice, truly evidence of love in Bethlehem, love divine of the God who is love, of the God who is generous to unworthy sons of men and who gives this son for the salvation of many. Lord, truly then, when he's born, the angel had it right. This is this wonderful good news of salvation to all the people. And so, Lord, in all the world, you are gathering your own by this message, by this messenger, by this son that you have given. We rejoice, and here we are to hear the word of God, and we pray presently so to open the scriptures that you would speak to us once again. Give us faith. Give our children faith. Give us to see not only what's seen, but what's invisible, the eternal and spiritual things of God in the gospel. And so may we rise above the glitz and all the hype and all the things on the radio that we hear and all the things that are in the churches even in the land which would focus merely on the humanness of it all. We want, Lord, ourselves to be overwhelmed with the presence of the divine in this wonderful, wonderful event. We want ourselves to go beyond what men say to what God has said in the fullness of time. We want truly to believe in something more than men and societies and governors and rulers can give and offer through their policies and through their inventions and through their healing. We want, Lord, the desire of nations. We want truly to be confirmed in our faith of the one who was given to save from sin and to bring us back to fellowship with God. So, Father, we pray that there may be this working of your spirit by the word of God and the declaration of it by an earthly angel so that we can all hear and come away and celebrate indeed with our families and friends and some of us perhaps alone, but no matter as long as we're with you so that we can truly have peace in our hearts and joy and a resolve to live unto you. And so, Father, that's our goal of our service right now, to hear from you, that we might fellowship with you in as we gather around the gospel of Christmas, and then that we ourselves may be those who serve you and who give in your name 
not only gifts of this earth, but who give in our lives, in our giving lives, so that people know the generosity, the charity, the love of God through us. So we pray, Father, give us to give praise to you. Give us to be your people that is truly glad in you. For the good news is glad tidings of great joy. Even so, Father, that our life becomes a song, a Noel of this one who's born, and of this one who's born to die, to be crucified for our sins, but of this one who's risen and is coming again. And Lord, even as we pray these things and are glad that you surely will hear us, this is your will, we are mindful and we pray that you would be mindful of our frailties and of our needs. Bless this congregation and all its needs, the family and the friends, those who may be visiting with us on this joyous occasion. And bless, Lord, so that in all of our life, these people, these sinners saved by grace, can truly trust in you and find in this new year as well a solace in the truth that the times, our times, are in the hands of the Father. We pray, Father, bless us in our needs. As some of us even in this very week submit to surgeries and have to bear the difficulties of convalescence. And we pray, Father, will you guide the surgeon's hands and guide so that there may be healing and a restoration of body and of soul, knowing the care of God. And those, Father, who have ongoing illnesses and sicknesses, Lord, we commit to you. Father, those who could not be with us, Lord, we pray your blessing upon them that they may know the Christmas peace and joy and the godliness of those who receive this gift from God. Lord, bless, we pray, our world. You have come into it, Father, to save your own in it. And we pray, Father, that you would save your own touch hearts and be with those who may even be persecuted for righteousness' sake. For the testimony of the truth, the real truth of Christmas, many lords suffer, and they're deprived even of even earthly things and gifts this very day. Bless, we pray, all that awaits your blessing. May all know the King of kings has come, and he reigns yet today, and he's coming again one day in glory. Hear us and bless us, we pray, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. An offering at this time will be taken for the gospel ministry at this church. May the Lord bless us as we give to this noble cause of Jesus Christ.
Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to the well-known passage of Luke chapter 2. I read this morning from the well-known and reliable translation of the King James Version of the Bible, Luke chapter 2, and we'll read verses 1 through 14. The Gospel according to Luke, the very Word of God, may God bless the reading to our hearts and to our living. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Thus far, the sacred scriptures on these verses of this chapter, verses 10 and 11, I want to meditate with you for a few moments as we hear the gospel declared of Christmas. The angel is speaking to the shepherds that were visited that solemn night. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Surely this visit by an angel to these shepherds was an unexpected visit. There the shepherds were minding their business, faithful shepherds watching their flocks by night. Lowly shepherds, caring not that this was uh, an occupation not among the elite and not getting them anywhere in society. They cared only to be serving the Lord in their occupation, which they would call a calling. But an unexpected visit, and you can imagine, an angel appears to them. We don't know which angel this was. Perhaps Gabriel who had visited Elizabeth and Joseph and, and Mary as well. But we're not told which angel this was, but this angel himself was on his business, the business that angels are always about, being a ministering spirit to the heirs of salvation. That's what angels are. They're not just these guardian angels, but they're ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation to enlighten us on the things eternal, even the word of God as it is in Jesus Christ. But lo, this angel came from heaven. And there was consternation among those shepherds. It's not always, of course, or even ever, that we would expect, after all, visits from angels. And here at night, and here, as all angels reflect reflecting the glory of the God in whose presence those angels constantly are. After all, angels are in heaven, 
And something, if I can say this as a man, wears off of the glory of God in them so that to behold angels is to behold something of the light of holiness, the light of this holy God who will not dwell with sinners. So here this angel comes from heaven and they're shaking in their shepherd boots, as we might describe this. An unexpected, terrifying visit. And that's why the angel has to calm them down and say, as often angels do when they visit with earthlings, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This is the occasion, then, of the first Noel, even. The angel has something not merely negative to say, don't be afraid, but very, very positive. And it's a relation from heaven of the thing that's come to pass, of the natalis, the birth of the Savior. And so I would call this announcement, this announcement of the good tidings of great joy which shall be to all the people, this announcement that unto us is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I would call this the first Noel. And let's meditate upon that first Noel, shall we? First of all, the first Noel, the angel did say, that's the first point, what did that angel say? And then secondly, to certain poor shepherds, and to all people as well, that in the second place. And then finally, Noel, 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 Noel. The song that reverberates along the corridors of time among the people of God. So, let's hear the first Noel that we might sing with joy. Here's the angel's message, a very compact sermon would that earthly angels, ministers like yours truly would have such compact, powerful sermons. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Isn't that amazing? A Savior. Think about that, first of all. What tidings this must have been to shepherds. And for all we know, godly shepherds, because they come and they see Bethlehem. They're not afraid of Bethlehem. And then they come back glorifying God. Certainly, they're not touched merely by an angel's visit but they've been touched by God and, and certainly impressed with this fact. A Savior is born. A Savior. And being Jewish shepherds, no doubt, in those hills of Bethlehem, they were aware of what that meant. As Simeon would be, and then Anna, who received the Christ child and, and beheld the salvation of God in him. This Savior is a Savior not from Romans only, but from sin. Here he is, little boar, babe born in a manger, savior from the greatest of evils, the guilt of sin, the wrath of God, and the pollution, the depravity that so besets us all as we're born sons of Adam. The savior is born. And He's a savior from heaven, from God. He's, he's anointed. He's the Christ. Look at that. This is the title that's given in all of its embellishment. The savior who is Christ and the Lord. He's the Messiah. That's what Christ means. The Old Testament Meshiach is now Christos. Messiah is the Christ. That is the anointed one. You see, this is so important for the shepherds to know. He's not just a savior, maybe among men. He's God's savior, the one God has appointed. The one of whom Isaiah said is the one upon whom is, there is this Holy Spirit who would bring the good tidings to the hurt and the halt and the maim and, and all kinds of sinfully maim. 
and sinfully depraved people. So he's the Savior who's the prophet of our salvation as the Christ, the spokesman from God, the one who speaks the word and people are saved. He's the Savior as the Christ who's the priest of God, who not only comes and ministers in the things of the holy temple, but he's the one who lays down his life. He's the priest who is a lamb. And he thereby reconciles people to God in the only holy way that the priest who would be Savior can and must. Isn't this glad? Further, he's the king. He's the king. That's what people knew of Messiah. He would unite in his own person the offices of prophet and priest and the king of the Old Testament, the office of a, an Isaiah and of an Aaron and of a King David. He'd unite them all and he'd perfectly, he'd perfectly reflect just what someone had to do in representing God to the people and the people to God and, and taking care of the business of saving poor sinners. That's what he's done and born to do. Children, this is wonderful, but hard to behold. He's just a little babe. He's just a little one. And he himself seems to be the one who needs ministering unto. And there he is in mother's arms, born of Mary, helpless babe, spoken to, cooed to, and he's the word of God. Helped along in this earthly life, and he's the one who gives life. One who is subject to his parents and willingly, and subject to the laws of the land and decrees of Caesar Augustus and so on, who says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God, God's. And he submitted to all of that. He's the king at the same time. Helpless babe, king of kings. The king is lying on his back. The king is gurgling as all children do. The king is needy, but the king is king. Amazing. And here he is, the savior who is Christ and the Lord, the ruler of the nations, the desire of the nations. This is the glad tidings. And he's born. Note here the historicity of the Christ event. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He's born. He's born. Now, this is the amazing truth. Of, we've recited that in the Nicene Creed. We believe that God took on flesh. And this is the truth that the angels are bringing to those trembling shepherds. This is the Noel. God took on flesh. This is the Noel of which the apostle speaks in 1 Timothy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh. Here it is, the story of eternity intersecting time, of the infinite taking on a finite form, a real humanity. The one who existed in all eternity, now beginning and yet not beginning in time. Isn't that amazing? Here it is, the mystery of Bethlehem. Here it is what so many miss today, and that's why they're not in church, they're just around their trees. We need to recover a sense of this mystery. He's born. It's real history. And as we read further on in this chapter, it's important that we know that there went out this decree from Caesar Augustus, yes, that there was a Cyrenius who was the governor of Syria at that day. And even the creeds locate these wonderful Christmas facts in facts of history. Why is it so important? Why is it so important that God, who would be this God who would save us and redeem us, come into time? Here's why. Because he's the God who really is God of all time. He's the real Savior. 
He's not just spirit. He's God who will be with us, who will identify with us, and who has chosen to reveal his own plan in dust and among dust and among the trees and in the valleys and in the mountains and in the stars and in a a manger. God with us now in our lives. God with us today. Isn't that something? That's the good news. The good news. The the glad tidings of great joy. Isn't that something how the angel says to the angel, uh, to the shepherds, fear not, I be, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And really, the bring you good tidings is just one, one word in the Greek language. It's called evangelize. Oyangelion, I evangelize you. I speak to you the good news, the best news, greater than anything you'll hear from men. I speak to you of a true world peace, of a true divine goodwill. I speak to you of the thing you need to hear. I call you, says the angel, you shepherds. That's my second point about this. Note, the angel appears to shepherds. The first Noel the angel did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. Shepherds. And then the angel goes on to speak of this news as being good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, literally all the people, all the people. What's going on here? I believe there's something of the the greatness of the love of God going on here. We don't want to miss it. First of all, the angel says, comes to shepherds, people, didn't come to their sheep, didn't come to animals, didn't come and speak into a valley or into the woods where no one was there to hear the angel, but the people. Now, again, not stretching this, but this is the text. The angel came to people. They happened to be shepherds, true, but they were people. And the good news is to all people. Why is that? Well, because people are the problem, after all. They're not the solution. They need fixed. They need justification. They need holiness. They need God. People are the problem in this world. Not guns. People. In Adam all die. They need life. You need life. I need life. All people need life. Savior announces through his angel the good news to people, the sinners, the ones who are not reconciled with God except they be reconciled in this one. That's the problem, people. Oh, to be sure, the message of salvation goes beyond the scope of people. God loves his world, and there's going to be a new heavens, a new earth, and the lying and the lamb, they'll lie down together. The whole creation waits, however, for the redemption of the sons of God. The people problem must be taken care of. The image must be restored. This message is to all the people, like shepherds, and then to all kinds of people. Note that. There's this universal aspect of the gospel. It comes to all kinds of people. Again, I think we learn love here. That God is not picky. That is, like we are. We pick the best. We pick the best Christmas tree. Maybe. 
We pick the best for our children. We, we pick the best for our clubs. We want people around us who are like us and all of this. But God, he doesn't pick that way. He's not picky according to merit and according to pedigree and according to degree and according to all of these measurements that we give to people. It's all of grace, people of God. That's the message here. So all kinds of people. No, not just Jews. And not just among the Jews, the high and the mighty, the chief priests and the scribes, to shepherds, to tax collectors, to fishermen. The message comes. The salvation comes to you and to me the chief of sinner, the gospel comes. And God says, it doesn't matter where you're from. My grace is what matters. Believe, believe. It doesn't matter how you've blown it, how you've messed up your life, messed up your marriage, messed up your career, wasted your time. The message comes to you now, you. And it doesn't skip over you because you're just not good enough. It comes to you. And the call is to you. Believe this. The wonderful thing about this good tidings of great joy, it it shall be to all people. It shall be to all people. And unto them, unto them all, For them, we could translate. For them, those people, is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And I believe there is once again the miracle of this message because of the miracle of this Christ child. The message when it comes is the message that's the power of God unto salvation. The message when it comes from the angel and now from earthly angels angels, is a message which comes and saves. The good tidings of great joy, the good tidings, see, the tidings themselves, the words themselves that are spoken by an angel and now by preachers everywhere are, are laden with power because they're divine words creative words and their salvation the words the message the truth is such salvation even that it's great joy that's something now you might be pondering and saying well how come not many are saved by this how can it be that there's this cosmic aspect of the gospel, this universality of the gospel and this message which is good tidings of great joy we're told is to all people and unto them is born this day in the city of, uh, of David the Savior which is Christ the Lord but, but not many get it. How can that be? Well, here's why. Because the message calls to believe those people. And the message is for the people of God whom he has chosen and to whom now this message goes and calls them to believe. But you see, not many believe it. To many, the the message comes and it falls on empty ears. Many today are avoiding the message and avoiding the house of God and avoiding the real reason for the season. And concentrating on their own gifts and and how they can make people happy in a human kind of way. In a Sears, Roebuck, catalog kind of way. They don't believe. And so the message, the good tidings of great joy is passed. It's, It's missed by them. Don't miss it. People of God, don't miss it. Those who call yourselves people of God, don't miss it. 
You see any Christian who may be hearing this sermon, you know what that is. You've been to church once this year, that was on Easter, that's the E, and now you're here again. It's Christmas, the C. You a C and E Christian? Are you a Sunday Christian? Or a real Christian? Behold, a real Christian. One who wants to believe, who's crying out, maybe now, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief, because there's a lot of unbelief in me. Unto you, no back. Fear not, I say to you. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. In that, finally, is for a song. The angel spoke that first Noel, that first relation of the birth of the Christ child to certain poor shepherds and Fields where they lay, keeping watch over their flocks by night, so that they would sing. And they did. When the angels were gone away, the shepherds said one to another, Let's now, now go into Bethlehem and see the things which are come to pass. And they came there, and then they went back, and they made known abroad the things that had been made known to them. I call that a song. I, saw, I call that relation, relating of what they'd heard, something of a song in Noel. I think, and we need to remember a few things here, if we really want to react like the shepherds and all good men and good women and true boys and girls who love the Lord Jesus. First thing is about this unexpected visit. Remember, the angel came to those shepherds at night and they were just shaking. They were. That's why the angel had to calm them down, say, fear not. You know what happened then? Heaven came to the hills of Bethlehem. Heaven. God was visiting the shepherds and the angel. God. You know what's happening now? According to the ordinances of God, God is speaking through another angel, yours truly, a minister of the word of God. And God is in the place. He is. And we ought to be fearing and trembling. It's something lots of people miss at Christmas time the fear and the trembling, the wonder, the pondering of Mary, the awe. Those shepherds, through this unexpected visit, knew that they weren't being visited by a wizard who was telling them to go on some exciting journey somewhere. They were being visited by God through that angel, and we are being visited by God through the preaching of the gospel to go to Bethlehem. To go and to see why, because there we see more than a mere squirming babe. We behold our God with us. That's Christmas. We behold Emmanuel. We behold him and we bow before him. If we're moved by the visit of God, that's it. It's being overwhelmed. Being overwhelmed. Flooded. 
drowned in the presence of God. Conscience, conscious of our own infirmities and our remaining sins and our need for God to tell us all is well, I love you. That's what he does. And we know this in the way of the fear and the trembling and the way then of hearing, fear not. I bring you, poor sinner, poor sinful single person, poor sinful married person, poor young person, child and young adult, I bring you good tidings of great joy. I do, the angel says, God says, I do. I love you. Nobody else does, you think, but I do. I do. And then there's joy. Then there's joy that way of godly fear, then there's joy. And that joy, the good tidings of great joy, is something, oh, there's something really happy about that message. Because there's not much to rejoice in here below, is there? Not much to rejoice in. And I think it, that's one of the reasons why we ought to turn off the radio sometimes a little more. And all the love songs and the love lost songs and, and all the internet stuff that seems to be so full of bad news. Imagine that 100 years ago without the technology. We'd have never heard about the shootings in Connecticut, except maybe a year later, indirectly. We'd never heard what's going on in the Middle East and all the bad news and all the riots and all these things. Not saying it's not good that we don't know. But sometimes being informed and wanting to be informed so much of the things of this earth can be very depressing, can it? I won't because it's not biblical, but I'm tempted to call for a fast on all technology. So that... We can simply go to Bethlehem, not via video games and the store and the deal and everything else that the world has to offer. Just go to Bethlehem. Crawl. But you can skip there too. Because you're happy now, aren't you? Because God has said, I'm your God, and behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And, and now the Spirit's working, so we're believing these things. And God wants his children to be happy. That's why his babe is born, his child is born, so that we might know the fullness of joy in God and might not despair of life, though our body is failing. No others have failed us, no I seem to be falling apart. Have great joy, and then you'll have a song. And they sang Noel, and you'll sing Noel, and I'll sing Noel, and the church will sing Noel all the time. Yes, in church we'll be happy. A sad church is a bad church, I'll put you that way. A reverent church, that's a righteous church. But not reverent and sad. Reverent and glad in the presence of God. We have the good news. And it's bubbling forth. And that's what it ought to do in our life. Our happiness is to be seen in our homes. Your home's not a happy place. Somebody needs to repent. Repent. We're not recognizing that God has led us together as husband and wife. And that it's not just to get along, but it's to thrive. We're missing the gospel of marriage. Not recognizing that work is to be good work, no matter what God gives us to do. And play is to be holy play. And yes, even if we want to, 
We can celebrate Christmas on a special day because we celebrate it every day. Behold, the angel God gives us today says this because God says this. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, to you. For unto you is born this day, my beloved brethren and sisters, beloved Church of Christ, for unto us is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Rejoice. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you with all our heart for the first Noel. In the record of this, in your word, and now the song of the Spirit in our hearts, we sing, we're glad. Even through the tears, we know the gladness that is in you, the peace that passes understanding, the Noel peace, the Christmas peace, the peace of forgiven sinners. We are glad, Lord, and we praise you. May our praise be glad all the day, this day and every day. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's turn now in song to the Psalter hymnal number 337, Joy to the World. And certainly this was the first Noel, of this joy to the world that the Lord had come. The three stanzas, 337. After the benediction, we'll sing from the doxology 490, I believe, 490. And then, uh, yes, 490 stands as one and two, but let's receive God's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.